introductions being completed. It is therefore now time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, uh, to the Premier, I couldn't get an answer yesterday, so I'm going to try again today. The tapes are clear, and now the Premier's Deputy Chief of Staff has been charged with bribery by the OPP. The people of Ontario want to hear from the Premier. Who ordered the Premier's Deputy Chief of Staff and top fundraiser to allegedly bribe Andrew Olivier with a job in exchange for a withdrawal from seeking the candidacy in the Sudbury by-election? Mr. Speaker, to the Premier. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, um, thank you very much. Uh, I've been very open with the legislature, with the media, and uh, with the public about the allegations uh, surrounding the uh, Sudbury by-election, Mr. Speaker. Um, now that the charges, now that charges have been laid, um, the the matter is before the court, and uh, it's before the court under a presumption of innocence, Mr. Speaker. Um, we'll continue to cooperate uh, with uh, with the authorities, with any in independent in investigation, Mr. Speaker. And Pat Cerbera has stepped down from her role. Thank you. Supplementary, the member from Leeds Grenville. Uh, Mr. Speaker, back to the Premier. The tapes are clear, and now the Premier's Deputy Chief of Staff has been charged with bribery by the OPP. The people of Ontario want to hear from the Premier. Who ordered the Premier's Deputy Chief of Staff and top fundraiser to allegedly bribe Andrew Olivier with a job in exchange for his withdrawal from seeking the candidacy in the Sudbury by-election. I'm not amused with some of the things I've been hearing, and I'll stop it. So you provide yourself with your own discipline and stop now before I do. Premier. Attorney General. Attorney General. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Speaker. Uh, um, I think, as the Premier uh, said earlier, uh, she has been uh, very open uh, to the public, uh, to this legislature, um, and to the media as it relates to the allegations surrounding the Sudbury by election. Uh, speaker, as we know, this matter now is before the courts, and it would be highly inappropriate for any member of this House to Maybe. engage. Uh, in any speculation uh, or questioning uh, that could uh, that would undermine uh, the, the court proceedings. We should respect that speaker um, and uh, let the matter be dealt with within the course. Thank you. Thank you. Final supplementary. The member Mr. from speaker, back Wellington, to the Halton Hills. The tapes are clear and now the Premier's Deputy Chief of Staff has been charged with bribery by the OPP. The people of Ontario want to hear from the Premier. Who ordered the Premier's Deputy Chief of Staff and top fundraiser to allegedly bribe Andrew Olivier with a job in exchange for his withdrawal from seeking the candidacy in the Sudbury by-election? Uh, speaker, it's, uh, it's unfortunate uh, that the uh, opposition uh, is uh, continue to ask questions that uh, should be really be dealt with within the realm uh, of the court of law. Uh, speaker, as you are well aware, we have a rule around subjudice within our standing orders uh, that, uh, that gives us sufficient guidance in terms of matters that may be before courts be not be uh, discussed or dealt with uh, in, in this House. Speaker, I want to also confirm uh, that this matter will be handled by the Public Prosecution right. Service of Canada, which is independent and separate from the Ministry of the Attorney General. Thank you. Thank you. New question. The member from Oxford. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. The tapes are clear, and now the Premier's Deputy Chief of Staff has been charged with bribery by the OPP. Minister of Indigenous the Relations. The people of Ontario want to hear from the Premier. For the fourth time, who ordered the Premier's Deputy Chief of Staff and the top fundraiser to allegedly bribe Andrew Olivier with a job in exchange for his withdrawal from seeking the candidacy in the Sudbury by election? Attorney General. Thank you very much, Speaker. Again, I, I say to the Honourable Member, the Premier has been very open to the public and to the legislature and, uh, um, and, and to the media on uh, facts and circumstances relating to the allegations in Sudbury by-election. Uh, now that there are charges laid, this matter falls squarely within uh, the scope uh, of the courts. It is highly inappropriate uh, for, for these questions to be posed or anybody uh, trying to answer any of these questions. These are the matters, uh, these are serious matters, Speaker, that will be dealt with 
within within the court of law and on this house of the side speaker from the government perspective we respect that independent impartial impartial process and we urge that all members of the house do the same thank you thank you supplementary question the member from defiant car speaker my question goes back to the premier the tapes are crystal clear and now the premier's deputy chief of staff has been charged with bribery by the opp the people of ottawa want to hear from the premier for the fifth time who ordered the, dep the Premier's Deputy Chief of Staff and top fundraiser to allegedly bribe Andrew Olivier with a job in exchange for his withdrawal from seeking the candidacy in the Sudbury by-election? Thank you. The Speaker, the Opposition can continue to ask the same question again and again as much as they wish to do. Uh, we on this side of the House are not uh, going to uh, interfere in a uh, court process, Order. Speaker. Uh, that is, uh, uh, these are uh, these are serious allegations, uh, uh, charges that have been laid against individuals. Uh, speaker, we must respect the process and the neutrality and the independence of the process, and let a court determine based on evidence uh, the outcome, uh, uh, not in this house. Thank you. Final supplementary. The member from Simcoe Gray. Uh, Mr. Speaker, to the Premier. The tapes are clear, and now the Premier's Deputy Chief of Staff has been charged with bribery by the OPP. The people of Ontario want to hear from the Premier. For the sixth time, who ordered the Premier's Deputy Chief of Staff and top fundraiser to allegedly bribe? The member from Barry, come to order. Please continue. To allegedly bribe Andrew Olivier with a job in exchange for his withdrawal from seeking the candidacy in the Sudbury by election. Thank you. Thank you. And, Speaker, for the sixth time, uh, this matter is before the court of law. And I think the As members Scott, from be. all uh, sides of the House, I believe, respect our course and the impartiality and the neutrality of our court system. This matter, Speaker, uh, resulting in serious charges and allegations Garfield are not to be prosecuted in the legislature. It has to be dealt with within the court of law. And, Speaker, it is our shared responsibility, as outlined in our own standing orders, that we do not interfere in that process. So I urge the members from all sides again uh, not to engage in any speculation uh, or cross-examination and let the courts do their job. Thank you. Thank you. New question. The member from Bramley, Gorham Alton. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. The Premier's top aide, Pat Sobera, and her Sudbury power broker, Jerry Lougheed, are now facing charges, as we all know, under the Elections Act. These charges stem from the alleged bribery of the Liberal candidate, Andrew Olivier, in the last, last year's by-election. Yesterday, the Premier failed to once again answer the main question that hangs over this entire scenario. Did the Premier direct either Ms. Sobera or Mr. Lougheed to offer an alleged bribe to Mr. Olivier? Uh, I'm going to remind the member, as I did yesterday, that there are ways in which questions can be put without uh, impugning somebody else in terms of a crime. I am going to remind him that if it gets that close again, I'll ask him to withdraw. Premier. Mr. Speaker, and uh, again, I have been very open uh, in this legislature. I've been open in the media, and I've been open with the public, Mr. Speaker. And if the uh, if the uh, member opposite uh, refers to past transcripts, Mr. Speaker, to past answers, he will see that there were many, many questions answered on this issue, and I talked about the process uh, around the Sudbury by-election. Right now, Mr. Speaker, um, we are dealing with a situation where the matter is before the courts, Mr. Speaker. Uh, under the presumption of innocence, we need to let that process uh, roll out, Mr. Speaker, and we'll continue to, uh, to cooperate with uh, an, an independent investigation. Pat, Sobor Pat Sobera has stepped down from her roles, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. When Pat Sabera, the, deputy, the Premier's Deputy Chief of Staff, called Mr. Olivier, she said she made it clear what the Premier had in mind. She said the Premier wanted to ensure that Mr. Olivier had, quote, a role. 
and she said, quote, if there were other things that you're particularly interested in that are within her realm to make you a part of, she is more than prepared to do that, end quote. Did the Premier ask Pat Severa to make that phone call? The member will withdraw, and if he continues in the same vein, I'll pass the question. Withdraw. Withdraw. Thank you. You may, you may, re, you may reword the question. Did the Premier ask Ms. Severa to make that phone call, and did she direct Ms. Severa to offer the alleged bribe? You just asked the same question I asked you to withdraw from. It's not going to happen. If I'm passing the question, the Premier has an option to respond. Thank you. The Minister of, Ab uh, the Minister of Indigenous Relations, second time. New question. When Jerry Lougheed, the Premier's Sudbury power broker, met with Mr. Olivier, he made it clear who he was working for. He said he had come, quote, on behalf of the Premier, end quote. He said there could be, quote, a reward for quitting the race. And he said, quote, the Premier wants to talk to you. We would like to present to you options in terms of appointments, jobs, whatever, end quote. Did the Premier ask Mr. Lougheed to make this phone call or make this visit, and did she direct him to make this offer? Stop the clock. I've taken the time to make sure that there's an understanding of why I'm not happy with the way in which the question is put, and I'll explain it. To have, I have to insist that members use parliamentary language when asking and answering questions. I accept that this is highly important, and I'm allowing the questions, which I should. But this perceived level of importance does not somehow exempt matters from normal rules of debate. It's not acceptable to make allegations against another member, even if it is done in a clever inference or an insinuation. The listener knows, I know, what is being implied. As it is said, you cannot or directly or indirectly do what you cannot do directly. Standing orders in the Rules of Debate, section 23H, page 20, indicates clearly you cannot make that charge. Hard-hitting questions are absolutely allowed and answers are allowed. I know that the members are skillful enough to be able to reword their question to avoid such a, a breach of the standing orders. The member has done it again. Please avoid impugning somebody in the House for committing a crime. You will have one more attempt. Uh, I completed my question, Mr. Speaker. Attorney General. Premier, Attorney General. Thank you. Uh, Speaker, Very first important. of all, thank you for, for your clarification in this very important matter, and I also find it surprising, Speaker, given the member opposite who posed the question is a defense counsel, and I know firmly believes in the presumption of innocence uh, to pursue this line of questioning. I think he also very, is very well aware as a, as a trial lawyer to know the importance of courts of law, the kind of evidentiary burden that is involved in, court of, uh, in the court of law and the neutrality and partiality and the fairness of our uh, judiciary in making those determinations based on evidence. Speaker, I'm sure he recognizes, as everybody else in this House, uh, that this matter is before the courts and we should respect their jurisdiction uh, and leave that matter in their hands. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Again to the Premier, Mr. Speaker. Uh, since the Premier doesn't want to tell us about the conversations that she had with Ms. Sorbera, that she may or may not have had with Mr. Lougheed, uh, and what they had to do with Mr. Olivier, I'm going to ask a different line of question. In the sworn information filed yesterday, the OPP says sometimes between November 19, 2014 and February 6, 2014, Ms. Sorbera did, quote, directly or indirectly give procure or promise or agree to procure an office of employment to induce a person to wit Glenn Thibault to become a candidate contrary to section 96.1 subsection E of the Election Act. What did the Premier authorize, if anything, Pat Sabir to offer Mr. Glenn Thibault to become the Liberal Party's candidate? Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Speaker. I think the member opposite knows quite well that this is not the place to cross-examine on a sworn affidavit. The appropriate place for that is the court of law in front of a judge, right. Speaker. Uh, so to reaffirm what you said uh, and to, to what I've said, uh, Speaker, before, it's our shared responsibility that this matter which deals with some very serious allegations, uh, be dealt with in a, in a court of law. Speaker, we owe that to Ontarians. We owe that to the people <laughs> accused who are presumed to be innocent in this matter until, uh, until a, 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 a determination uh, by a judge. Uh, so therefore, Speaker, again, I urge the, uh, the, the member opposite who posed the question and all members uh, to respect uh, our, our judiciary and let's focus on issues that are important to Ontarians. Thank you. Final supplementary. Uh, this is part two, I believe, Mr. Speaker. The OPP alleges that Mr. Lawheed and Ms. Obera, quote, committed the offense knowingly and are there, thereby guilty of a corrupt practice. And now, for the first time, we've learned that one of those charges relate to uh, the now Minister of Energy, Mr. Thibault, and his Liberal can Party candidacy. Will the Premier tell us right now what were the 30 pieces of silver that she and Pat Sabera offered to Mr. Thibault to get— Order. The member will withdraw. Withdraw. Pass. New question. The Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. In sworn information, the OPP says between November 19, 2014 and February 6, 2015, Pat Sapera did, and I quote, directly or indirectly give, procure, or promise or agree to procure an office of employment to induce a person to wit Glenn Tebow to become a candidate contrary to Section 96.1e of the Election Act. Mr. Speaker, this is, this is shocking. My question for the Premier is, did the Premier's Deputy Chief of Staff offer the current Minister of Energy an office in order to induce him to become a candidate. We deserve an answer, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. That was Laurie's you're talking about. Now take that the, outside, Jim. The, uh, 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 excuse me. I was uh, quite prepared to deal with what I heard, and someone else has got herself into the mix. The, de the chief government whip will come to order, and now the member from the Pian Carlton will come to order. Premier. Yeah. Attorney General. Attorney General. Well, Speaker, again, uh, you know, same question uh, uh, is being asked, despite uh, despite what you asked us to to consider, Speaker. Again, uh, uh, my response remains the same because, uh, as the Attorney General, I uh, will and the government will remain uh, very respectful of the jurisdiction of our courts. Uh, this this matter uh, it now has, uh, since the charges have been laid, has now proceeded to the court uh, courts and. Uh, that it should be dealt with at that level. Speaker, I would uh, reaffirm uh, again that this matter will be handled by the Public Prosecution Service of Canada, and we leave it up to those prosecutors uh, to, to make the case uh, based on whatever evidence they have available uh, to them and a judge to make a determination. Thank, Thank you. you. Supplementary, the member from Leeds, Grenville. Uh, yes, yeah, Speaker. Uh, back to the Premier. And quite frankly, people want to hear from the Premier. They don't want to hear from the Attorney General. Here, here. In the sworn information, the OPP says between November 19, 2014 and February 6, 2015, Sorbera did, quote, directly or indirectly give, procure or promise or agree to procure an office of employment to induce a person to wit Glenn Tebow to become a candidate contrary to Section 93.1e of the Election Act. Speaker, did the Premier's Deputy Chief of Staff offer the Minister of Energy an office in order to induce him to become a candidate. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Speaker. And, and once, once again, the Premier has been, has been very open uh, to Ontarians. Uh, she has answered questions uh, of the media, and she has answered questions surrounding these allegations right here in this House. 
However, Speaker, uh, the Premier is also very mindful of her responsibility uh, in terms of uh, the process, uh, in terms of the presumption of innocence, uh, in terms of uh, allegations being just allegations. The matter is before the court. That is the most appropriate venue, uh, Speaker, for it uh, to be determined uh, with, with, uh, with all the weight around rules of evidence and other procedures. Uh, we respect that, Speaker, and uh, we uh, uh, look forward to having this matter dealt with within the course. Thank you. Thank you. New question. The member from Nickel Belt. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Ma question pour la première ministre. My question is for the Premier. Lawheed to the Greater Sudbury Police Board in 2011 and then again in 2014. Chief Second time. Yesterday, Mr. Lawheed was charged with bribery under the Ontario Elections Act. When will the Premier rescind Mr. Lawheed's appointment to the Greater Sudbury Police Services Board? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, speaker, uh, you know, um, the opposition can keep asking the same questions again and, and again, again, Speaker. Uh, the the answer does not. Uh, the answer. Thank you. Answer, please. The uh, Speaker, the answer remains the same. Uh, these are allegations as it relates to uh, a, a court matter, Speaker. It is only appropriate uh, that it be dealt with within the course. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Speaker. Yesterday, Mrs. Sorbara was charged with bribery under the Ontario Elections Act. Yesterday, Mr. Lawheed was charged with bribery under the Ontario Elections Act. Yesterday, the Premier asked Mrs. Sorbara to step aside. Yesterday, the Premier did not ask Mr. Lawheed to step aside. For the people of Sudbury, it seems like a double standard, Speaker. When will the Premier rescind Mr. Lawheed's appointment to the Greater Sudbury Police Services Board. Thank you. Attorney General. Uh, uh, speaker, uh, uh, when it comes to uh, the, uh, it's my understanding, Speaker, when it comes to appointments to the Police Services Board, that's a decision of the, the board itself, uh, not that of, of the Premier or, or the government. Uh, uh, speaker, so uh, there is a process under the Police Services Act uh, that, is, uh, that is provided for. Uh, to deal with matters uh, matters like this, um, and uh, it's, it would be highly inappropriate for us to, to speculate as to uh, how the process is. But I can I can assure you, Speaker, the Premier does not uh, have uh, the power or the capacity within the legislation uh, to remove somebody uh, from from a police service board. Thank you. New question: the member from Kingston in the Islands. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister responsible for Seniors Affairs. Minister, I want to begin by thanking you for visiting my riding of Kingston and the Islands to meet with seniors. On Saturday, we had excellent coverage of your visit with OASIS, a non-profit senior supportive living centre. I was also very pleased that you visited the Kingston Seniors Association for their annual general meeting. It was great to see you that you are making time to travel and meet with seniors right across Ontario, and I'm sure that this is providing you with great great insight into the unique challenges and opportunities faced by our communities across the province. Your efforts will undoubtedly give you a fresh perspective on what seniors living means, and I know that there is no replacement for that first-hand experience. Mr. Speaker, can the minister responsible for seniors' affairs inform the House about her experience meeting with seniors in Kingston and the Islands? Question. Thank you. Minister responsible for seniors. Thank you, Speaker, and I want to begin by thanking the honourable member for her important question. And I just want to thank her, Mr. Speaker, for all of her advocacy on behalf of seniors in her riding. It was amply clear, Mr. Speaker, that uh, the, the good people of Kingston uh, are very appreciative of the member's work, especially on behalf of the seniors. And Mr. Speaker, as uh, the member mentioned, I did in fact have the privilege of visiting seniors in Kingston, as well as in Ottawa la just last week. In Kingston, I met with two groups. Uh, who provided key insight into the challenges seniors are facing in Ontario. But, Mr. Speaker, not only did, they, did I get an insight into the challenges 
facing seniors in Ontario, but more importantly, I also got insight into how communities are coming together and taking the initiative to address these challenges. Answer. My meeting with OSS, for example, was truly inspirational, where I had lunch with seniors who were so proud to be thank living you. independently. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the minister for her answer and for her commitment to improving the lives of seniors in Ontario. I'm very pleased to hear that you're so greatly inspired by the efforts these groups are making. I've been working with these groups as well and share your enthusiasm about their commitment and their energy. And I agree that it is important to foster a sense of community and support between seniors groups. As you mentioned, you did not just stop in Kingston but traveled to Ottawa as well. I understand that during your visit, you met with leaders of many of Ottawa's elderly persons centres and students from the Retirement Home Management Program at Algonquin College. Mr. Speaker, could the minister update this House about her meeting with these different groups in Ottawa? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Speaker. And again, I want to thank the member from Kingston and the Islands for this question. Indeed, I did go to Ottawa as well, where at the Good Companion Senior Centre, I met with a number of representatives from the elderly person centre leaders in the area. At the Good Companion Senior Centre, Mr. Uh, speaker, I was, uh, you know, I was very impressed by this one facility, uh, a groundbreaking program for seniors that's called Senior Center Without Walls, where a telephone program is used to offer recreational, educational, and health-based phone seminars for individuals unable to physically access community centers. This, Mr. Speaker, is a great example of using a low-cost, innovative way through the telephone of addressing social isolation. And I came away very impressed, Mr. Speaker, with Answer. this program. I also uh, visited the Algonquin College Algonquin College's ambitious Adult Day program for seniors with dementia. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Speaker. Question the member from Dufferin Caledon. Mr. Speaker, to the Premier. The Premier's Deputy Chief of Staff has been charged with bribery by the OPP. The people of Ontario want to hear from the Premier. Did the Premier's Deputy Chief of Staff offer the Minister of Energy an office in order to induce him to become a candidate. Yes, sir, Attorney General. Attorney General. Attorney General has spoken about this issue. She's answered questions in the media. Attorney She's answered General. questions in this House. Um, now that uh, there are charges laid, it's uh, highly inappropriate for anybody to uh, engage in a, in a conversation. Um, um, that's not appropriate, Speaker. It's uh, the matters before, uh, before the courts, and it is our shared responsibility that, that we respect that and let it be dealt with uh, in a court of law. Thank you. Supplementary. The member from Nipissing. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I would like to direct this to the Premier, please. The Premier's Deputy Chief of Staff has been charged with bribery by the OPP. The people of Ontario want to hear from the Premier. Did the Premier's Deputy Chief of Staff offer the Minister of Energy an office in order to induce him to become a candidate? Thank you. Um, uh, uh, speaker, the Premier has, has addressed this question today here in the House, and she has done so uh, with, the, with the media. Uh, speaker, uh, the Premier has been absolutely transparent, but the Premier also respects uh, the court process. Uh, it, this is not the time or the place, Speaker, to, to engage in any kind of cross-examination. Uh, that that place is, uh, is, is in, in the court, uh, and, and uh, we should respect that, Speaker, and I urge, again, all members uh, to follow the rules that have been outlined um, in the standing <laughs> order, as you indicated earlier, Speaker, uh, where we respect legal proceedings and not prejudice uh, those proceedings whatsoever. Thank you. Thank you. New question. The member from Niagara Falls. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Yesterday, I was back in Niagara to meet with Helen. Helen has been put in a terrible position by this government. You see, her parents have been married for 70 years and were never apart before they needed long-term care in August. Helen's father, Clarence, is a resident of Shalom Manor in Grinsby, but her mom, Jessie, is at a home in St. Catharines. Clarence and Jessie have never been separated. In their final years, after spending a lifetime together and under a completely inadequate couple reunification program, chances are they may never live together again. My question is simple. What will the Premier do today 
to help Helen reunite her parents and make sure they don't spend another day apart. Mr. Speaker, I know that the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care is. Oh, sorry. I know that the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care is going to want to speak to this, but I just, I just want to say personally to the member opposite that this is an issue that is extremely important to me personally, and I think to all of us in this house, because we all know. We all know couples, whether there are parents or whether there are grandparents or whether there are aunts and uncles, we know people have been together for 50, 60 years who need to be together in those years. It's like they have become one unit. And so, Mr. Speaker, um, we, are, we are doing everything we can to make sure that that is the standard, that that is what happens uh, in every situation. And as I say, I know that the, uh, the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care will want to speak to this specific. Thanks for that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I know that no one in this House today, including the Health Minister, would ever want their parents to be separated in two different long-term facilities in different cities after a lifetime together. It is wrong for couples to be separated after spending 70 years together just because they need long-term care. Jesse is 92 and Clarence is 93 years old. They miss each other terribly. They need to be together. They are worried about each other and should not be divorced by a long-term care system. Will the Premier commit today to reunify Jesse and Clarence and give them the dignity and the respect of living together for their final years? Question. Thank you. Thank you. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Long Care. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And um, this is a, a, an extremely important issue. Uh, we're talking about people's homes, and we're talking about two individuals who should reside in the same home. They shouldn't be separated. In fact, in our long-term care system, the highest priority we have for finding a bed, for transferring to a different bed, is spousal reunification. So there is no other priority that we put a, attach a higher uh, priority to. In fact, we introduced regulations uh, in our Long-Term Care Homes Act to enable us and enable residents in different homes to be reunified. It should never happen in the first place. I only wish that the member—this is the first I'm hearing of this—I only wish that the member actually had have approached me on this. I can't speak to the specific Answer. issue. But rather than raise it in this forum, I believe it's an issue that we could have resolved together, Mr. Speaker. Your question, the member from Pittsburgh Centre. It's all about politics. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Economic Development and Growth. We see Ontario's information, communications, and technology sector growing rapidly and driving innovation in our economy. And when you visit my riding of Kitchener Centre, you certainly see evidence of that. Waterloo Region is where the smartphone, the BlackBerry, was invented. And it's where young entrepreneurs continue to innovate in software and hardware creation and in future technology that will no doubt change the way that we live. This dynamic entrepreneurial environment, in conjunction with the GTA, has been labelled the Toronto-Waterloo Region Technology Corridor, with companies such as Google, Shopify, Thelmic Labs, Research in Motion leading the way, and thousands, yes, thousands of tech startups, these businesses are creating well-paying jobs. Speaker, the minister was Question. recently in California pitching Ontario. Could he please tell us about the prospects that came thank out you. of that trip? Minister of Economic Development and Growth. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member for uh, Kitchener Centre for, for that question, but more so for being such a huge champion of innovation in the ICT sector in her community of Kitchener-Waterloo. And as I try to respond to that question, Mr. Speaker, I think about how important it is for us to accomplish our role of passing on a good economy, a, a thriving economy, to the next generation. Uh, when I look at the fact that Ontario is now second in North America in ICT to California, and I look at Chloe, uh, Jerry Phillips' uh, granddaughter, 
over here uh, as Jerry's preoccupied with one of Chair, my colleagues. Please. And, 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 I, uh, and, and I say that's what it's all about, Mr. Speaker, and the young folks here in this audience. It's building that next generation economy. The fact we're number two in North America, the fact we're, 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 uh, we're, we're, we're attracting investments from Slack, Square, Google, Cisco, Amazon, all those Thank great you. companies bodes well for our economic future. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and I'd like to thank the minister for his answer. It's very encouraging to hear that he's actively promoting our most innovative companies and expanding access to global markets. When I sit down to hear from tech sector stakeholders in Kitchener Centre, especially those who have chosen to locate in our community, they always offer a very long list of very interesting reasons as to why they've chosen Waterloo Region and Ontario to hang a shingle. I can tell you that my own son, who started a high-tech company in Kitchener a few years ago, he has a subsidiary in Southern California and a sales team in the Pacific Rim, but he chooses to keep home base for his company in Ontario for a number of reasons. Speaker, could the minister please speak about that? Considering the intense competition on the global scene, what makes Ontario an outstanding Question. place to do business, especially in the tech sector, and what else is this government doing to ensure growth in this sector? There you go. Yeah, no, sir. Mr. Speaker, the member from Kitchener Centre is bang on. Uh, we need to continue to help our local companies grow as well. We need to help them scale up. They're doing extremely well, and we're producing some of the best young, talented entrepreneurs anywhere in the world today. Our role now is to help them scale up so they can create huge multinational companies. So we need to maintain that global edge by ensuring we have the most, of, the lowest effective corporate tax rates in North America. That helps. We need to ensure we have the most generous ROD tax credits in North America, which we have, which is attracting them. And we need to ensure that that huge flow of talent coming out of our post-secondary institutions <laughs> that are attracting investments to Ontario and helping these, these companies scale up continues. Mr. Speaker, we're going to continue to Answer. work with that through our business growth initiative. We're going to continue to drive this economy, and we're going to continue to help those young, successful entrepreneurs scale thank up you. to become globally competitive. New question. The member, the member from Needs Grendel. Well, thanks, Speaker. My, my question is to the Minister of Energy. In the sworn information, the OPP says between November 19, 2014 and February 6, 2015, so Rivera did directly or indirectly give, procure, or promise, or agree to procure an office of employment to induce a person to wit Glenn Tebow to become a candidate contrary to Section 96.1e of the Election Act. My question, Minister, what were you offered to become a candidate? Here, here. There are uh, two issues uh, that I would uh, share with you. First, uh, within the ministry uh, responsibilities, th that's what's supposed to happen uh, when question period is on for the government. Uh, and the second issue is, is that there is a, um, it's, it's what I spoke of earlier when I responded to someone earlier in that it, it was a side way to do what I asked not to happen, which is to imply somebody was doing something improper. If that's if that's the case, and I am going to rule on the ministry stuff, I, I'm going to ask the member to re-ask the question in a way that does not make an, imp uh, an implied, uh, an implied um, allegation. So I'll, I'll let the member, I'll let the member have an attempt to ask that question in a different way. My speaker, my question: What were you promised to become the minister of energy? That, that's, I'm not. I'm not going to permit that question because of the nature in which I explained already. Excuse me.
order will come to order. The member from Nepean Carlton will come to order. The member from Simcoe Gray will come to order. The member from Dufferin Caledon will come to order. The member from Dufferin Caledon, second time. The member from Leeds Grenville, thank you. The member from Leeds Grenville. You're not uh, being helpful. The member from Leeds Grenville, come to order. The member from Leeds Grenville, second time. The member from the member from Leeds Grenville is warned. The member from Leeds Grenville is warned. The next next question. The member from Nickelbelt. Finance will come to order. The member, the Minister of Finance, second time. Stop the clock. The Minister of Education will come to order. The Minister of Finance, I don't think he heard me, it's the second time. <laughs> Member from Davenport, come to order. New question, the member from Nickel Belt. Sorry. The, the member from Bramley Gore Malton. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. The OPP alleges that Mr. Lougheed and Ms. Sabera, quote, committed the offense knowingly and are thereby guilty of a corrupt practice. And now, for the first time, we've learned that one of those charges relate to the offer that Ms. Sabera made whether or not it was made to Mr. Thibault, now the Minister of Energy, to become the Liberal Party's candidate. Will the Premier tell us if she's aware of what was offered, what the discussions were, who made those discussions to Mr. Thibault to get him to run for the Liberal Party? Thank you. Thank you, General. I, uh, thank you very much, Speaker. Again, um, the member opposite is a defense counsel. He's been in, in the courts a lot, uh, and I know that he knows uh, the process. I know that he knows and understands the concept of presumption of innocence. I know that he knows the subjudice rule that I outlined in the, um, in the uh, standing orders. Speaker, so I am a bit surprised that he continue I'm on not. behest of his party and operatives to ask the same questions, which he knows that is not, this is not the appropriate place to answer. So once again, I, I respectfully ask the members opposite uh, to recognize and respect our shared responsibility and let this matter be dealt with in the course of law. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. There are certain things that are achieved in the Court of Justice through the criminal justice system which require proof beyond reasonable doubt. There are certain questions that can be answered here in Parliament, and I stand by that very proudly, and we need to get those questions answered here. <laughs> Members of Parliament. Members of Parliament in Ottawa made a salary of about $167,000 last year. MPPs in this House make significantly less, but cabinet ministers here in Ontario make about $166,000, which is virtually the same as what MPPs in Ottawa make. Now, whoever discussed with Ms. Severa the bridging of salary, the gap between Mr. Thibault's MP salary and the MPP salary, and whether or not appointing him to the cabinet was a part of that discussion. Attorney General. 
Speaker, that's just an absolutely, um, absolutely a ridiculous question. I think, according to the members, Matt, uh, Matt uh, the member from Sudbury took a sixty or seventy thousand dollar pay cut, uh, Speaker, so that he can serve the people of his riding. Speaker, that's what made, motivated the member from Sudbury to run so that he can continue to build schools and hospitals in his community so that he can serve his constituents in a manner that is that is relevant to their lives uh, speaker speaker um, uh, you know again uh, I, I, I we find and I find these line of questioning highly inappropriate uh, speaker because they impugn motives uh, as you have stated earlier this matter is before the court let's resp respect their jurisdiction thank you thank you new question the member from Barry Thank you, Speaker. My question today is for the Minister of Northern Development and Mines. It is important for Northerners to know that their government is making investments in the North that will encourage job creation and economic activity. Speaker, more and more film and television productions are looking to Northern Ontario. Well-known, critically acclaimed films such as Sleeping Giant and Born to be Blue were both produced in Northern Ontario. I understand that the film industry in Northern Ontario is a significant source of jobs and plays an important role in the local economy. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please explain what this government is doing to support job creation in Northern Ontario and support Northern Ontario's film industry? Thank you, Minister of Northern Development and Mines. Thanks so much, Mr. Speaker. Thanks to the member for Barry for that question. And we are very proud through the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund Corporation for really building a film industry in, in the North. And the just member last from Hamilton month, Mountain I was joined by Jennifer Jonas, producer of the uh, acclaimed film Born to Be Blue, to host a screening of the film in my riding of Thunder Bay Superior North. Great opportunity to celebrate the dynamic films being funded through the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund Corporation. Speaker, our government is working hard every single day to help strengthen and diversify the northern economy and create good quality jobs for people in the north by supporting the rapidly growing film and television production sector in the north. And when film and television productions come to town in, the, uh, in any community, local hotels, restaurants and businesses see increased activity. We are seeing film equipment studios being put together, full board studios being put together, and local residents are finding opportunities uh, for spots as extras on the set or jobs as crew members. So through the Northern Ontario Heritage Answer. Fund Corporation, our government is continuing to work hard to build great economic development momentum in Northern Ontario. Great. Thank you. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, it is clear that this government is committed to supporting and growing the film and television industry in Northern Ontario. This support is critical because for every million dollars of film and television production, it ends up generating 21 full-time direct and associated jobs. I understand that the minister recently made some announcements in Northern Ontario on the investments of the government that the government is making through the NOHFC for the television and film industry in the north. Speaker, through you to the minister, can the minister please explain how these investments have helped the television and film industry in the north and what this, what this means for the people in Northern Ontario? Thank you, Minister. Member for Barry, for the question. It really is a tremendous story. Last year, Mr. Speaker, film and television production um, added $1.5 billion to the provincial economy, securing Ontario as the number one film and television production center in Canada, the third largest by volume in uh, North America behind only California and New York. And in this past year alone, Mr. Speaker, the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund Corporation has invested over $13 million in 23 film projects produced across the North, and that means all kinds of communities are benefiting from it. And because of the NOHFC's investments in the film industry, the North, the North is now home to e equipment rental companies film studios, casting companies, and post-production facilities. This is allowing for full-service production facilities right here in Northern Ontario. So investments in film and television production are part of our economic plan to build up uh, Sir, Northern Ontario, deliver on our number one priority to grow the economy and to create jobs. Thank you. Thank you. New question, the member from Bramley, Gore Malton. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Is the Premier aware of what was discussed between Mr. Thibault and Ms. Sobera when it came to him running for the Liberal Party? Thank you. Thank you. Attorney General. Uh, speaker, this matter is before, before the court, and uh, we respect the jurisdiction of the court, and I urge all How members to do the same. How did you become Deputy Thank Leader? You. Thank you. Thank you. 
Supplement. Thank you, sir. Uh, if there was any offer made, who made the offer and what did it consist of? Speaker, this matter is before the courts, and it will be highly inappropriate to answer any such questions in this House. Uh, we ask all members to respect the jurisdiction of the How did he become deputy leader? Thank you. Thank you. New question, the member from Davenport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Attorney General. Uh, many Canadians were moved and inspired by the outstanding performance by Gord Downey and the Tragically Hip during their farewell tour this summer. That's right. However, many hit fans, including many from my own riding of Davenport and really from all across Ontario, could not get tickets to see this iconic Canadian band perform for the last time. In a matter of seconds, shows across the province were sold out, with some tickets later appearing on the secondary market at an inflated price. Mr. Speaker, this is wrong, and this left fans frustrated and disappointed. I also know that this happens with other concerts and sporting events. Fans just can't get tickets, no matter how hard they try. I know that the Attorney General agrees that this is a problem and that our government needs to take action to help fans across Ontario have a fair shake at getting tickets Question. to their favourite events. Can the Attorney General please tell this House about our government's plan? Thank you, Attorney General. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. I want to thank the member from Devonport for asking a very important question. Speaker, too many people across Ontario Ontario know what it's like to try to get tickets for their favorite band or sports team, only to find out the tickets have sold out in, the, in seconds and are being resold at an inflated price on the secondary market. What happened with Tragically Hip uh, tickets this summer speaker was case in point. Uh, it personally really bugged me uh, that fans weren't getting a fair shot at buying those tickets. And I was really inspired, Speaker, by the MPP from Kingston and the Islands, uh, who identified why this is happening. Scalper boards were buying up huge numbers of tickets in seconds with just a few clicks of a mouse. This member, Speaker, has a, had a great idea that we need to ban scalper bots. I would like to thank the member for her work, hard work, Speaker, on this issue and for her idea that will help fans across Ontario. I, I'm pleased to let this House know, Speaker, that building on the work of the member from Kingston and the Islands, I'm committed to taking action as the Attorney General. This spring, I will be introducing legislation that would, if passed, ban scalper bots. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the Attorney General for his response, and I'm pleased to hear that our government is committed to taking action on this issue and building on the work started by the outstanding member from Kingston and the Islands. I think that everyone in this House would agree that this member had a great idea, and I would personally like to thank her for all of her great work. So thank you, Sophie. By banning scalper bots, our government is sending a clear message to fans that we believe they deserve a fair shot at buying tickets. I know that people in my riding of Davenport will be very happy with this news, especially when the next big show comes to town. I also know that both the member from Kingston and the Islands and the Attorney General want to increase transparency in the ticket selling industry. While I know this will be a difficult task, can the Attorney General tell us more about our government's plan to ban scalper bots and the work he will be doing over the Question. coming months? Thank you, Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker, and again, thank, thanks from the member from Deborah for, for asking this important question. Um, and Speaker, the member is right that th this will be a challenging uh, task. Uh, there is no um, silver bullet to this problem, Speaker, but it's also no excuse for inaction. Over the coming months, I will be seeking input from people all across the industry and from fans with targeted consultations. We need to hear from primary ticket sellers, from artists and venues, from consumer protection group, law enforcement, and most importantly, a fans uh, speaker. I'll also be working closely with the MPP from Kingston and the Islands and rely on her expertise and the information that she has gathered as she was developing her private member's bill. We know, Speaker, that this problem is not unique to Ontario, so we'll also be looking at other jurisdictions who have taken on this fight. Answer. I'll be reaching out to my counterpart in New York State to discuss the findings of his recent investigation into this issue. I'm confident that the legislation Thank we you. will introduce next spring will transform the ticket selling industry. New Thank question, you. Member from Kitchener, Waterloo. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Are the allegations, as reported in the Sudbury Star, regarding Mr. Thibault and his candidacy for the Liberal Party true. Attorney General. Senior, Attorney General. 
Speaker, uh, uh, once again to the Thanks member opposite that this uh, that this member uh, this this matter is before for, before the courts and uh, it will be highly inappropriate to uh, engage um, any conversation or speculation around these matters. Uh, we should respect the responsibility of of the courts and uh, let them the uh, deal with this matter. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I don't think it's appropriate for the government to tell us what an appropriate question is in this house, uh, but I will say. Again, I will ask the Premier, does the Premier think it is appropriate to offer a cabinet position in exchange for a political favour? Speaker, I don't think there's uh, ever any any room or place in this house to, uh, to, mix, uh, to so engage in speculation either. Speaker, uh, you relied on standing order rules that uh, clearly outlines the subjudice rule, clearly outlines the supremacy of our courts and the respect for our courts. I know the member respects uh, the process and respects the rule, um, and I'm just urging all members, as the Attorney General of this province, that we should let the matters be heard before the court of law. Thank you. Thank you. New question, the member from Northumberland, Quinty West. Well, thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question to the Minister of Education. <coughs> Minister, we have a lot to be proud when it comes to students' achievements, thanks in large part to our great educators and staff. Our schools are recognized across the country and around the world for excellence in education, and this is something we are extremely proud of. I understand that November 1st marked the beginning of Financial Literacy Month. As we all know, preparing students to be financially literate is essential to student success in a stronger economy. Speaker, through you to the minister, can you tell us more about the importance of, of financial literacy and what this means to, for our students? Thank you. Minister of Education. Thank you, Speaker. And I want to thank uh, the member for that really great and timely question as we've just uh, kicked off Financial Literacy Month here in Ontario. Mr. Speaker, Financial Liter Literacy Month is the perfect opportunity to highlight the importance of this topic. The member from Ancaster come to order. The member from uh, Hamilton East Stony Creek will withdraw. Withdraw what? I'm withdrawing. Oh, yeah. Okay, I withdraw. Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, yesterday I had a chance to meet Prakash and Tom from the Toronto Youth Cabinet. It was truly inspiring to hear the stories behind their motivation to broaden access to financial knowledge for all students Answer. across the province. We spoke about integrating more financial literacy into the Grade 10 careers curriculum, and I'll have more to say about Thank that you. in the coming days. Supplementary. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Minister. We all have a role in helping our kids learn about financial literacy. Point of order. The member will take his seat. I do not entertain points of order unless I know that it is uh, an important issue. The Minister of Indigenous Relations is warned. Carry on. Thank you, Speaker. And I'm pleased to hear that uh, students in my riding are le learning about sound money management, responsible financial decision making, and planning for the unexpected. Minister, I couldn't agree more when you say talk. When you say talk about the need to prepare our children to be financially literate and effectively contributing citizens in our ever more complex global economy. Question. Minister, can you please tell us more about what the government is doing to broaden the financial knowledge and skills of our students. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we have so many grade nine students here today with us. And for them and for students across the province, financial literacy means that having the knowledge and the skills to take responsibility for managing personal finances. And most importantly, it means participating in society as knowledgeable, responsible citizens who can confidently make decisions about where and how to invest their money. We all have a role in helping our kids to learn about financial literacy, and I'm pleased to hear that students in my riding, Mr. Speaker, are learning about sound money management, responsible financial decision-making, and planning. Mr. Speaker, 
In 2011, our government committed to making financial literacy a part of every student's learning from grades 4 to 12 by way of Answer. financial literacy education initi initiative, Mr. Speaker. And that means students across grades, Mr. Speaker, are learning about saving, Thank spending, you. and investing. New question, the member from Nickelbelt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. In the candidacy of Mr. Thibault for the Liberal Party. Thank you. Attorney General. Uh, speaker, uh, as I've said it, uh, stated earlier, uh, this JP matter is before the, the court, and uh, it will be highly inappropriate to answer any questions uh, relating to the matter that will be uh, subject to a court proceeding, as we know. Um, therefore, uh, Speaker, it's, it's not appropriate for us to um, engage in this discussion in the House. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Back to the Premier. What was Mrs. Sorbara's role in the appointment of Mr. Thibault to Cabinet? And it will be highly inappropriate to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. New question. The member from Durham. Thank you. Just a minute. Chief Government Whip is warned. Carry on. <laughs> Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister, in my great riding of Durham, we have seen unprecedented in investment from our government, from the 407 East ex expansion to Go Train to Curtis and Bowmanville, and most recently, $12.8 billion for the refurbishment of Darlington. The growth has been tremendous, with more new families moving in every day. It is a very exciting time to serve as MP MPP for Durham. As you recall, we have spoken on many occasions about moving forward with expanding the Bowmanville Hospital, one of my top priorities. We have worked closely with Lake Ridge Health Administration, the Foundation Board, local businesses, as well as countless constituents and stakeholders to further this project. I am very proud of how far we have come, and I thank you and your staff for their support along the way. Now, in spite of all this hard work, the Question. Ontario Health Coalition is saying that the Ajax Lake Ridge Health Integration will lead to a re reduction of health services in both Bowmanville and Port Perry hospitals. Thank you. Be Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member from Durham. He has been an absolute champion for the Bowmanville Hospital. We've had meetings, Mr. Speaker. We've had discussions, Mr. Speaker. But this gives me the, the opportunity to set the record straight. Let me be clear. The Bowmanville Hospital is not closing, and they will not experience any reduction in services or cuts. There are no plans whatsoever to change the programs or the services, and certainly not to close that hospital. In fact, Mr. Speaker, I've received a new proposal for an emergency department at the Bowmanville Hospital, and I look forward to continuing consultations with Bowmanville and Lake Ridge uh, on the future possibilities for the ER. In contrast to what the Ontario Health Coalition is saying, the proposed integration of the Scarborough Hospital, Answer. Rouge Valley Health System, and Lake Ridge will, in fact, improve and expand services across Scarborough and Durham. Mr. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. That's great news. I am glad that we are able to assure residents that the quality of their health care in Durham will improve under the integration. There has been too much misinformation. Would you be able to provide some insight to my residents as to how the decision for hospital integration was made? Thank you. Minister. Well, thank you again to the member of Durham for that question. Uh, these, Mr. Speaker, these decisions, of course, were not made lightly. They followed a long consultation process. There's a panel that was struck uh, that, uh, that provided uh, recommendations to us earlier this year, the Scarborough West Durham panel. Uh, the advice was also provided by the Central East Local Health Integration Network and is the resulting work, and I want to commend and congratulate the two well, the many hospital boards 
and leadership over the past few months in involving their communities to prepare for this next step. Over the next uh, several months, the boards, hospital staff and physicians uh, will continue to work collaboratively to develop the hospital structures required again to improve the delivery and quality of health services to both the Scarborough Answer. and the Durham communities, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Your question, the member from Durham, Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we're seeing an unprecedented scenario. This question is to the Premier. We're seeing an unprecedented scenario in this province. The amount of scandal that this government is responsible for committing is just outrageous. And today is testament to that frustration. We know already that it's very clear in the Elections Act that to directly Order. or to indirectly give or procure an inducement to get someone to run is a contravention of the Election Act. But we want to know from the Attorney General or from the Premier that under this, under this Act is the acceptance of an inducement to office, is the acceptance of something in exchange for becoming a candidate, is that acceptance a violation of the Elections Act? My question is to the Premier. Is the acceptance in and of itself a violation of the Elections Act? Attorney General. The speaker, the speaker, once again, the Premier has, has spoken on this, on this uh, matter. She's spoken in this House and she's, uh, she's spoken uh, uh, to the media um, that these are, these are serious allegations, Speaker, and, and, and therefore it is, uh, this is not the place to litigate these, these allegations. Uh, a court of law, Speaker, is the appropriate uh, venue. The member opposite knows that. I know, Speaker, the member op opposite uh, knows that, and I urge all members, uh, as I've said uh, it, throughout the entire question period, to respect our own standing order rules, Speaker, to respect our, our courts, and let this matter be dealt with in the court of law. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, the response provided by the Attorney General is not in the best interest of the people of Ontario. It may be the best interest of the Liberal Party, though. We know very well from previous experience the Orange scandal, the results weren't obtained by a court investigation. The results getting to the bottom of the truth were obtained here in this Legislative Assembly, with questions in committee, with questions in this House. There is a strong tradition of getting to the truth, of providing justice to the people of this Ontario, the people of Ontario, by asking questions to this assembly. So my question again is, does the Attorney General, does the Premier believe the, the acceptance of an inducement to an office, to a position, is that a contravention of the Elections Act? And is the Attorney General providing any sort of guidance or legal representation or advice to anyone involved in this circumstance? Question. Uh, speaker, once again, the, the difference in this matter is that there are allegations and there are charges that are laid uh, uh, by the police. Uh, speaker, therefore, this matter is squarely within the jurisdiction of the, of the court. It will be up to a, a court to determine uh, whether or not those allegations uh, have been proven in the court of law or not. Speaker, I've also been very clear that this matter is not being dealt by the, uh, the Ministry of the Attorney General. It's being dealt independently uh, through the Public Prosecution Service of Canada. Speaker, I've, I stated that first thing yesterday morning, and I repeat again that this is a this is not being dealt with uh, a matter. The persons accused have their own uh, counsel, and the prosecution is being handled by the Public Prosecution Service of Canada. Thank you. Thank you. Unless it's a point of order, it's over. Point of order, the member. So. I just want to remind everyone that Hospice Palliative Care Ontario was having the reception 228 at 5 o'clock tonight, and please come by. Thank you. There are no deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 3 p.m. this afternoon.